Revival being released, just God's ready to pour out. I mean, I know there's a lot of hungry people out, and I've even had some responses in that situation. But I don't know what's up. I don't know what the Lord has specifically in mind. But it's just about red pop. And I think that's a term somebody mentioned Sunday. It's about red pop. Right. That's that was Jason. Yeah. Yeah. So just want to be in line. <laughs> Amen. Let's just pray for. Lord to reveal uh, what his purpose is and his plan. And let's just continue to pray for, for people uh, for the hunger. I think it's been talked about several different times. I know it was brought up by different people. Mike, I know you mentioned it. I see Dan and others mm -hmm. independent of one another. Just how they felt like that's what the Lord is doing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> sensitive to the people we're coming into contact with. Amen. Not just to get them into this church, although we do obviously we want to invite people uh, and get them into the presence of the Lord and expose them to the gospel, but uh, just that even the people that are not going to come here, you know, God will fill the church. We used to always say, you know, just go out and invite and, and uh, interact with people and God will send the people.
just thank the Lord that he's using you. Amen? Mm-hmm. Anybody else? Yeah, John. <coughs> Yes, he is. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Yeah, Dean. He said, if you can give a prayer for the man and women up there at Mecca, I'm trying to get him to come. One of them says he's coming Sunday morning with me. Good. Praise Keep the Lord. Them in your prayers. Yes, amen. We'll just pray that God uses our invitations. And uh, I mean, that's all we can do is, is make the invitation, but the Holy Spirit can quicken that and so we'll, we'll definitely be praying for God to use your testimony and your invitations in a way that's going to be a benefit to other people. So. Yes. Anybody else? Yes, Suzanne. hand to be on them, protect them as they travel to and from their destination and they have a very positive experience. God is glorified. Yes, Suzanne. And um, they work for my husband. He is an Let's just hope they keep their relationship together long enough for this to. And God still honored, even though it's the end times of our sister recovery. That's okay. That's okay. Praise the Lord. God can bless us. You know, I mean, He does. He He takes. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with Budweiser, but uh, <clears throat> it's you know what I'm saying. He He blessed people with using sinners quote unquote sinners all the time so no matter what your image of that is you know yeah I mean there's some negative obviously things that come out of uh, alcohol and so forth but the product itself is innate it's like money you know money is just uh, amoral you know in the hands of a good person money can be a good thing hands of a bad person it can do evil stuff so uh, you know most things are that way it's just how we how we use it so God can bless him right there with the bud. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're not endorsing it. We're just saying it's okay. <laughs> Thanks, Lord. Okay, we're going to pray for all of these needs. But while we're doing that, let's, let's anoint this cloth. This is for Sheila to take with her. And we'll all just come together here and pray for this, and then we'll just continue on.
ask us to ask so that we can receive. So we're just verbally expressing, Lord, our faith by even asking, Lord, so that if it's within your will, Lord, then we know that you hear us. And if you hear us, then we know we have our petition. So we celebrate right now, Lord, that we have the victory, we have the answer to our prayer, healing is coming, deliverance has been released, prosperity, direction, everything mentioned here, Lord. Wisdom, anointing of the Holy Spirit, momentum, Lord, even for the word that has been released, that it will have impact and have traction in people's lives. And move them, Lord, to come to you, to receive you, to be saved and to be delivered. We ask it all in the name that's above every name, in the name that can never lose, in the name that is always victorious, in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. All right, let's, uh, I think we confess the word next. It's been so long since I've done any of this. Ah, announcements. Yes, we do have uh, Eastern Gate House of Prayer. That's coming up the, is it this Friday or next week? Next Friday. Week from Friday. Yeah. Week from this coming Friday. If you're going to be here, be here at 7 o'clock. Uh, between 7 and 9 usually. But anytime you can come within that time, come. Mm -hmm. If you can come for a half hour, 15 minutes, an hour, two hours. <laughs> if, if the Lord moves, just stay till it. Kelly quits moving, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And, uh, but it would be good to come in unity. I mean, when we come together like that, mm -hmm. it, it, it magnifies the Lord. It magnifies what God's doing. Mm -hmm. And you never know. You may have a word that, uh, that everybody else needs to hear. Glory. And then again, they may have a word that you need to hear. Amen. God's trying to speak to you, and he uses other people to do it. So come and just show the unity of the church, and, and let's just believe God for revival. Let's believe that Hallelujah. God is going to impact this city. And uh, he can't. You know, if God's going to move, he'll, as we're reaching out to strangers, mm -hmm. he can move with the people that are closest to us, yes. family members, loved ones, friends, yes. that, that maybe we haven't been able to reach, but God can still do it. Yes, Lord. So uh, let's believe for that. Amen? Hallelujah. All right. Let's confess the word. Uh, the only other thing I know of is daylight savings time Sunday. Actually, it's Saturday night. 2 a.m. Sunday morning, so if you don't want to stay up, you can set your clock ahead. Right here. And what? The 22nd of March, soup, salad, and whatever other little things people want to bring, but it's definitely be soup and salad, so plan on staying for dinner. Amen? Amen. All right. Will you not revive us again? That your people may rejoice in you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, I was just going to say, uh, this is always the danger of having me do this. But Suzanne, I know, brought this up a while back. When we first came up with Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, we were talking about the different things. That, how we, I mean, obviously we understood it was scripture and it was appropriate for what we were doing. But had no idea how that would play out over time. And so God gives us scriptures, just like God does. And a lot of times we think, we get to the point where it's just kind of rote, you know, and we, we're really not thinking about the power or the impact of it. It just becomes something we repeat. But I'm telling you, God gives us these things because it's what he wants to do. Yeah. He wants it to come from us, but he's the one that plants the seed for us to do it in the first place so that then when he fulfills it, we know that it came from him. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that that scripture is appropriate, and more than appropriate, I believe it is directly what God wants to do in this particular body. So we need to say it, but we need to say it believing it, that just like anything else that we pray, it's a done deal. It's just a question of manifestation, and we're going to see it. Amen? Amen. All right, so I'm a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak with new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Praise God. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I have this body in the name of Jesus. And that's what I would have said. <laughs> Uh, 
not in the body, actually, it was a little above that. I received the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I'm not conformed to this world, but I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Praise God. All right, God bless you. you may be seated. And of course, John can come forward, and if he would be. Good enough to take up the offer. The officiant Praise the Lord. Go ahead. Lord, the blessing. Thank you tonight, God. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, to receive of you and to give out, God, as we move in every way we pray. Yes. For your blessing and anointing on this service and the message and our ears and hearts to receive it. We just want to praise you and just pray for each one as we give to you financially and just with our attention and our love, God, that you just bless everything and just grow in you and you get the glory in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. 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 The Lord bless you as you give. I'll tell you what. Um, <laughs> you can't put my finger on it. Maybe I'm not supposed to. You're supposed to walk in it. Hallelujah. You know, I like to talk about the donkeys talking and everything else and, 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 the, and the word and stuff, saying stuff that people need to hear. And I was watching a stupid movie the other night. I don't know why. It was a uh, caveman movie or something. Made in 81 called Quest of Fire. You know, even some sometimes revelation comes through people doing stupid stuff and everything else like that. Check this out. This was written at the beginning of the movie. The rest of the movie, it was, it was a yawn. Anyway, <laughs> my daddy watched it like this. Uh, fire was a symbol of power and a means of survival. The scribe who possessed the fire possessed life. Figure that one out for what we're in the midst of right now. Hallelujah. So it's on. I, I, I know, you know, half the worship team's not here and stuff like that, but um, the ones he wanted, the ones he, I believe specifically, the ones he wanted here tonight are here tonight. Um, I don't know what's up. It, the river's deep and flowing fast. Uh, I know, I forgot to ask earlier, but to, for us to pray for, I hear another soprano to work with Tammy and also another alto to work with Suzanne. Um, Tender's got it. Let's uh, pray it in. I know we don't have the room for it, but guess what? He'll figure it. He's already got it figured out. Just yeah. gotta listen to what he's planning. So let's enter in. Let's just go after God. Um, the revival's already started. We just need to step into it. <laughs> Time fades and days go by. Earthquakes and buildings are falling from the sky. Yet a new day breaks and still another reason why to live. Okay. 
mothers fail and children hide. Hearts are broken from the hurts they have inside. And yet a new day breaks and still another reason why. the generation who will stand and fight in the midst of all the darkness who carry the light we are the generation who will stand and fight in the midst of all the darkness who carry the light
Cause your mercy goes much deeper Your grace it rescues me Your mercy goes much deeper Farther than I can see Your mercy goes much deeper Your grace it rescues me Your mercy goes much deeper Farther than I can see, I reach for you when I'm going under. I wait for you, Jesus. You're my life. Your mercy goes much deeper. Your grace that rescues me, your mercy goes much deeper, farther than I can see. Lord, your mercy goes much deeper, Lord, your grace that rescues me, your mercy goes much deeper, Lord, farther than I can see. Where could I go? Where could I stand? How could I leave the shelter of your hand? Where could I go? Your grace it rescues me. Your mercy goes much deeper, farther than I can see. Your mercy goes much deeper. Your grace it rescues me. Lord, your mercy goes much deeper, farther than I can see. Lord, I. How could I leave the shelter of your hand? I love your grace, and where could I go? Where could I stand? How could I leave the shelter of your hand?
your grace that rescues me. Your mercy goes much deeper, farther than I can see, farther, farther than I can see, farther than Praise I God. can see. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just love you tonight. Thank you for all of your blessings, Lord for the so many unseen things that you're doing in our lives. Thank you, Lord, even for the encouragement to pray so that your will is done in our lives. We thank you for every blessing, Lord. We have expectations based on your word, Lord, for good things to happen in all of our lives, Lord. We expect miracles. We expect good things, Lord, because you're a good God who blesses your children with only good gifts. We thank you for it tonight, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing, what you'll continue to do. In Jesus' mighty name, we love you, Lord. And in your name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you. Worship team. I was almost going to say just happily. It's kind of abbreviated, but good job, everybody. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're going to just, uh, I want to read just a couple of places in Scripture here from John chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 3, and then we'll go to John chapter 4, 7 through 9. So we're going to start in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And we've been talking about, you know, uh, we call it witnessing, but it's, it's really just conversation. And uh, when we interact with people, whether they're believers or non-believers or kind of semi-believers, we want to just be sensitive to what, the way the Lord dealt with people. And... Uh, you know, if, if, if we can, it, it's gotten to where it's so easy to try to emulate or imitate other Christians instead of imitating Jesus. And uh, I think when you see the way Jesus interacts with people, you understand right away he's not vicious, he's not mean, he's not overpowering, overbearing but he's sensitive to the individual that he's talking to. And, uh, you know, we, we could get to the place where we just have a rote kind of uh, ritualistic way of interacting with people and forget that everybody's an individual. And if we deal with them within the confines of our relationship with them or the, within the, the type of relationship we have with them, we could just be ourselves. We don't have to, you know, be something quote unquote super spiritual we already are whether we know it or not we are super spiritual we're spirit beings we just need to go with the flow go with who we are and what we are and that God will use and just remember that everybody's in the same boat no matter what they say we're all in the same <laughs> we're all dealing with the same God we all have the same kind of issues I mean I'll talk about that a little bit tonight. Sometimes we kind of look at people and say, oh, this is really a big deal. This is really a bad thing that they've got to deal with. And we feel like it takes more to get that person than it does maybe somebody who doesn't seem to have as many external issues going on. The fact is everybody's the same. 
God looks at all of us identically. It all takes the grace of God for everybody, whether they are, quote, unquote, a big sinner or a little sinner. There is no such thing as big sin and little sin as far as God's concerned. It's just either people are believing or they're not believing. And so it's really all we have to do is introduce them to Jesus and uh, introduce him to a real Jesus, the real deal. Amen? So we're going to look at a couple of things here that I think are interesting. And beginning here in uh, John chapter 3, there was a man of the Pharisees. Now these are, these are stories you're all real familiar with. And the thing about these stories is they, ha they really develop the individual person. Uh, the, not all the stories in the Bible do, but these two actually do kind of develop the individual character of these people more than, than a lot of them. So it gives us a little insight that we maybe wouldn't have otherwise. But there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All right, now let's go to chapter 4, and let's begin at verse 7. We'll just read 7 through 9 to begin with here. Seven through nine, yeah. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Okay, so we got in John chapter 3, Jesus meets this uh, very moral uh, individual. He's a uh, civic leader. He's a religious leader within this community. And then in the very next chapter, he meets a social, moral, religious outcast who happens to be a woman. So what's interesting is that we rarely ever or I've never seen anybody actually connect these two stories. And I think there's a reason these two encounters appear one right after another in the scripture, in the way that John uh, writes it. I think they're supposed to be considered together. But they seem to be so different, and their circumstances are so different, that you wouldn't think they could have anything to do with each other. But as different as they are, what we need to look for is what they have in common. Because if these two people have something in common, then everybody has something in common. Praise the Lord. So the point of the two stories is, biblically, no one can escape the fact of being a sinner. So if you start with John chapter 4, the woman at the well, it starts with a picture of sin that almost everybody recognizes right away, right? You read the story, and everybody can identify this is a sinner. Praise the Lord. So let's, let's go back to John chapter 4, and let's read 7 through 19. We'll read the, basically the, the major part of the story here, or at least the, the fourth part. John chapter 4, 7 through 19. We'll, we'll go back over it again. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. 
But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband, and that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Praise the Lord. So when Jesus begins to speak to this woman, he's deliberately uh, reaching across almost every significant barrier that people can put up between themselves. There's a racial barrier here. There's a cultural barrier here. There's a gender barrier, uh, barrier the, the moral barrier. Every, 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 and everything you can imagine, and, and as well as the conventions of that time. He's a Jewish man who wouldn't even normally speak to a Jewish woman, let alone a Samaritan woman, in public. So it's, it's a, a, just a huge, th you know, barriers here that are being overcome. And so Jesus, the amazing thing here is that Jesus just doesn't care. He doesn't care about the cultural issues, the racial issues, the gender issues, the moral issues. The convention, the, the, the fact that, that she's a Samaritan, he's a Jew, they don't speak, they, you know, the, he, he just doesn't care. And that's radical. Mm -hmm. right. It's radical. And it was radical at that time, and it ought to be radical for us. We ought to see it. She's amazed at this, and we ought to be amazed. We ought to realize this is a big deal. James, do you need a handkerchief? Grab a Kleenex there or something. Praise the Lord. So uh, there's a, a major overcoming here that, that Jesus is doing. And the woman identifies or recognizes immediately how outrageous this is of, of what he's doing. And if we don't see it, if we don't understand that, it's going to be difficult for us to be radical when it comes to us reaching out to people. He doesn't disrespect the woman. He just gets into the conversation with her. He just starts talking to her, and he doesn't care what barriers there are. He doesn't care that she may be immoral, that she may be a woman, that she may be a Samaritan, that she may be uh, you know, from a totally different culture, that, that these things clash nor normally. He just doesn't care. He just reaches out and begins to talk to her. And he uses this metaphor of living water. And he uses it because as a, it's a basic necessity that you have to have, right? Water is an, something everybody's got to have. And he uses it as a, as a metaphor for spirituality. So he's saying, what I want to give you is something you need as bad, if not more, than you need water. Amen? Amen. He's saying, without this water that I give, it will be like you didn't, like you couldn't get this water that you put into your body to keep you from dehydrating and dying. The water that I have for you is just as critical. It's just as important because without it, you'll be absolutely lost. Mm -hmm. e and even more, in John chapter 4, verse 14, look what he says. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Amen. So he's talking about a deep down satisfaction, a spiritual fulfillment, contentment, something that doesn't come or depend on what's happening outside of us. Praise the Lord. So if you ask people, what, what is it that makes you happy? Invariably, and almost without exception, they'll answer something outside of them. They'll say romantic love, uh, career, money. Amen? 
Something that will give them value, something that gives them significance, something that gives them security. Praise the Lord. Now, that's true of a lot of Christians as well as unbelievers. But Jesus says there's nothing outside of you that can really satisfy the thirst that's deep down inside of you. Jesus says, I can give it. I can put it into you. Now, when you think about the conversations you have with people and how this bears out in our relationships with others, because as long as you think that there's a chance that you can achieve your goals and your dreams, that you still have a shot at success. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying you shouldn't have any goals or shouldn't want to have success or, or be successful or, or accomplish some things. But I'm saying as long as people think that there's a chance they're going to achieve those goals and those dreams and their success, when we experience inner weakness, inner emptiness, we recognize it as drive, not a hunger. Mm. Not a spiritual hunger. We recognize it as something, a motivator, something that's motivating me, driving me to be the best, to be successful, to, you know, to accomplish my dreams and so on and so forth, and become oblivious to how deep our thirst actually is. So we live almost our entire lives, and I'm, I'm just using that language for people in general. And living out our lives without ever admitting to ourselves the depth of our spiritual thirst. Because we're always looking at what's going on around. Now, to some degree, the Christian church is guilty of perpetuating that by making things more about what God can give you than who God is. Amen. As if you have the hunger, he says, if you will seek first the kingdom of God, if your hunger is after God, he'll take care of all those external needs, all the outside stuff, the successes and everything else. If you don't have that, your, your drive will take the place or be a substitution for the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is basically telling this woman in this story. Now, everybody worships. Atheists worship. Everybody worships. I don't care what they say. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what we're going to worship. Right. Now, the insidious thing about different forms of worship, like the worshiping career, worshiping you know, money, worshiping relationships, worshiping other people, whatever it might be, Success, failure, whatever it might be. The, the, what is so bad about that, when we think about ourselves, our wealth, our career, other, another person, is that we don't realize it. In other words, we're worshiping that thing or that person, but we're not conscious of it. Right. Does that make sense? I mean, think about, I'm talking about mainly unbelievers, but it's even true with some in, in the believers. Don't, please, don't think me uh, critical of, of people that have a drive and a, a dream and a plan and a purpose. Well, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying only when that thing becomes the Jesus, you know, the biggest deal, mm -hmm. rather than Jesus being the biggest deal and that thing taking the side. Mm -hmm. But you think about people that are not saved, people that are not Christians, that's their whole life. That's everything. And they don't even know that they're hungry. They just think this inner drive that I have to succeed, this drive that I have to get this woman to love me or this man to love me or to have this success or to reach this particular place in my life, they, they see that. They think that that is, uh, is what's causing the hunger, this desire for success, this desire for whatever, when in fact they're missing the truth that, that the real hunger, the real thirst that's deep down inside of them will never be satisfied by those things. I was watching a program this afternoon, talking about Mike and, and weird shows. It's called Behind the Mansions or Inside the Mansion Walls or something like that. But it's about crime that happens and travesties and things that happen in 
wealthy people's lives. And it's one of these, like a cop show kind of. But it's about people that have millions of dollars and end up killing their entire family and themselves. I watched like three different shows. I was just awestruck by it. How successful, quote unquote, these people are. Got the trophy wife, you know, got the, you know, everything, got the whole deal, you know, the millions of dollars, the biggest state, the, you know, everything, the big fancy cars, the whole deal. And they end up killing themselves or killing their family or burning the house down on top of them, one guy did. I mean, it was just insane. Because they got what they thought was their hunger, what their, you know, drive was put, pushing them through. They reached that success. They got to that place of, of uh, financial, you know, beyond well-being to where they had more money than they knew what to do with. They got the relationship they were after, but they're still empty. They're still hungry, thinking all the time that that's what that drive was about, and that that wasn't it at all. It was a hunger for God. It was, a, it was this thirst for Jesus. It's in, all, it's in everybody. It's in every human being. I don't care whether they claim to believe or don't believe. It's there. And so th this is, this is what, what happens, you know. You become unconscious of that, and then our spouse or our girlfriend or boyfriend or job or career or finances or whatever becomes a default setting. We just drop back to that. Instead of pursuing Jesus... We always end up back trying to get this thing or to get that thing or to succeed in a certain area or what have you. So I said we, a lot of times people forget how thirsty they are because they believe that they'll be, be, be able to fulfill their dreams. And so it's easy to walk right past Jesus in the pursuit of the success or the multi-million dollars or whatever it might be. Amen? So this woman at the well, <clears throat> fortunately for her, had no such illusions. So the hook is set. Amen? That's why a lot of times it's easier to win the person that's at the bottom, that has just bottomed out, that has just failed. That, I mean, I've been there. You start looking for something besides success and, and <laughs> exterior stuff. When you've gone through it and it just isn't doing you any good. And you hit rock bottom and you've got to think there's got to be something besides this. And that's when you start looking there. So a lot of times it's easier to reach the people like this woman at the well because they don't have any illusions about success. They've already been there. They've already been down that road, right? So this woman has been hooked, you might say. Look at, uh, let's look at chapter 4, verse 15. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water. She's, she's got this figured out. That's what I need. This water you're talking about is what I want. Give me this water so that I don't thirst anymore, so that I don't have to come back here to draw. Mm -hmm. Right? So she says, give it to me. Then look at verse 16. Jesus saith unto her, Go. Call thy husband and come hither. Let's look at verse 17 and 18. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not your husband. And that said you truly. All right, so why does Jesus seem to suddenly change the conversation? Well, he really doesn't. It just looks like it on the surface. Because what he's doing here, to understand this water he's saying, you need to understand how you've been seeking it. Yeah. And she sees it, and here's what happens in verse 19. The woman says, I believe you're a prophet. In other words, she says, you just read my mail. This thing I've been, this, this thing I've been hunting for and searching for and seeking after, I thought it was a man. But I've been going through them like water over the dam. And they haven't satisfied. They haven't fulfilled this thirst. And Jesus says, I'll give you something that will satisfy you so you don't have to keep going to the next one and to the next one and to the next one. And she immediately recognizes this is the issue. And she says, give that to me. 
and says, you're a prophet. You know what's going on in my life. You, you, you know what's happening here. So, praise the Lord. Look at verse 21 through 24 here. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, now we always look at that and we think that it's about, she's saying, you know, our people worship here. And you worship. But Jesus really isn't, that's not the argument here. Because he's saying, what, the problem here is what we're worshiping, not where we're worshiping. Right. So he's leading her to that place to where he said the day's going to come when this living water is going to be available. Mm -hmm. That's what you'll be pursuing. So that's what he's really talking about. The hour cometh now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Now she's overwhelmed by this. And she responds in verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. Now she's putting two and two together here. She's realizing there's something spiritual is the answer. And Jesus is talking about worshiping in spirit and truth, so she's getting past this religious kind of mindset. And she said, I know that when Messiah comes, which is called Christ, when he's come, he'll tell us all things. And then Jesus drops the bomb. Verse 26. I that speak unto thee am he. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I want you to look at this encounter that happens just before this one now. So let's go back to John chapter 3, 1 through 7. Because Jesus meets this very important man, a Pharisee a religious and a civic leader. Just, the, I mean, the antipath to this, uh, antithesis to this woman, just the opposite. So there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now this is really a lot like the conversation he just, the tail end of the conversation he just had with this woman, mm -hmm. only it was just in different language, basically. Right. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. But now here's what's interesting. It's almost the opposite of how Jesus treated the woman at the well. Right. Amen? Mm -hmm. With her, he's gentle, he's open, he's accessible, you know, and uh, he slowly, gradually confronts her with her spiritual need. He doesn't just slam her in the face and say, here's what you got to do. He just, little by little, he eases her into this awareness of what her spiritual need is. But here, he's forceful. He's pretty direct. Amen? Uh, chapter 3, let's go back to verses 2 and 3. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, now the guy's being nice. Rabbi, we know that you're, you're a great teacher from God, for nobody can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus doesn't even respond to that. He just says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He can't see the kingdom of God. Right? He just says, you got to be born again. Yeah. Now, Nicodemus has spent his entire life worshiping God according to strict Jewish traditions, mm. rules, regulations. And he had to be offended. Right? right? In fact, he, you can kind of see it in the language when he says, what? 
I'm going to go back into my mother's womb? Yeah. You know, he's, he's kind of offended by what, but by what Jesus has said here. But uh, he's saying, like, born again? Now, this guy is a respected religious community leader. He's looked up to. He's a moral person. He's a good guy. Amen? But it's interesting. He calls this younger guy, Jesus, who's actually uneducated in terms of how this Pharisee was educated. He's much younger than him. He shows respect to him. He calls him rabbi. So he is open-minded, even though he's a religious Jew. Mm -hmm. he, he's, he's showing some, some respect and, and some uh, open-mindedness, maybe, that, that others hadn't. But you've got to be born again. <coughs> and he's thinking, now, come on. I have to be born again? Now, he doesn't understand. He, he, he isn't seeing the the story to come, but or the story that has just taken place, but but I mean he's thinking, look, come on, uh, there's somebody out here on the street who's homeless, who's addicted, and you're telling me I got to be born again. <laughs> but as far as God is concerned, this guy and the woman at the well are equals. They're both lost. Praise the Lord. Both need eternal spiritual life. Both have to be born again. Or something's going to eat them alive. And this born again life has to be a free gift. So the definition of sin is really looking to something else besides God for your salvation. Right. Yep. That's the biblical definition of sin. It's the first of the Ten Commandments. I have no other gods before me. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? So here's the, here's the way it works. One of the ways that we put other gods before us or try to be our own savior is that we, we break all the moral rules. And we break all these moral rules, rules in pursuit of our own happiness or pleasure or satisfaction. Right? We're looking for a way to, to, to be fulfilled and to be satisfied and to be happy or to be contented outside of God. So we do drugs. We do alcohol. We get into one relationship after another. We do, that's what people do. We make sex or money or pleasure or power. We make them a kind of salvation. So one way is we break all these rules like the woman at the well. But then there's the religious way to be your own savior. To act as if your good life and your moral behavior and your rule keeping will require God to bless you. Now, I think it's pretty obvious in these two stories, but this isn't something we ever hear about normally in church. Right. The woman is a sinner. The Pharisee just hasn't quite understood everything yet. But as far as God's concerned, they both are headed for the same destination. The means of getting there is just different but they're both sinners. They're both moving away from God's grace and God's salvation, trying to produce their own, trying to satisfy themselves and to fulfill themselves in some way outside of God. Right. See, looking, looking to moral goodness and self-effort to give you significance and security is what non-religious people look to sex, drug, 
money, and power to give them. Mm-hmm. It's the same mm-hmm. as far as God's concerned. Yep. What's insidious about all this is that religious people constantly talk about trusting God. Yeah. But if you think that your goodness is even contributing to your salvation, then it's self-salvation. Mm-hmm. It's sin. Praise the Lord. Mm-hmm. Now, you may not be committing adultery. may not be literally robbing people. Talk about this religious person. But the more you do this, the more your heart is being filled with pride. The more it's being filled with self-righteousness. Mm-hmm. The more insecurity comes. The more envy comes. The more spite comes. Mm-hmm. And that makes the world a miserable place a miserable place to live for people that are around you. Right. Now I know anybody that's been in a religious setting knows and have known people like that. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying you know, they have a predetermined plan. It's just the result. It's what happens. They become arrogant. They become proud. And then they become insecure. Why? Because they know deep down inside they cannot do enough. Their insecurity then then causes them to envy other people or to judge other people or to be critical of other people ultimately making everybody around them miserable. And so people that are unsaved look at them and go, my God, who wants that? I mean, it's the epitome of the Pharisees' attitudes whenever Jesus would confront them. That's why he called them vipers. That's why he called them snakes and and thieves and liars and so on and so forth, because they were phony. He knew it, and they knew it. So Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman are equal sinners in the in need of grace. Mm-hmm. They need to be saved. Right. And so are we all. In every case, trying to put God in our debt. And God says, I'll be a debtor to no man. Mm-hmm. Right. You can't do anything that's going to make God. I mean, what are you going to do that's going to make God owe you? But that's what a lot of religion teaches. You do enough good stuff, then God's going to bless you. That's sin. If you continue reading John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman tells her friends about this living water that she found. And she invites everybody to come meet the Messiah. Now let me ask you a question. Why did she find salvation? Well, I'll tell you why, so that you can all go home, praise the Lord. It was because Jesus was thirsty. He wouldn't have come to the well if he hadn't been thirsty. And if he hadn't been thirsty, he wouldn't have been at the well when the woman came. And she wouldn't have found living water, right? Right? Okay, so, but why was Jesus thirsty? She found living water because Jesus said, I thirst. Remember the beginning of that story? He tells his disciples, I thirst. He stops, right? Look look at John chapter 19 and verse 28. This is the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, he's on the cross. All things are now were accomplished that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Wow. Now, Jesus obviously meant a whole lot more than a physical thirst here. Because what Jesus was experiencing at this moment was the loss of of the relationship with his father. Right? He's he's burying all of our sins. He has now been cut off 
He's a sinner. He's separated from God, something he had never experienced prior to this. So he's taking the punishment that we deserve for our sins. He's cut off from the source of living water. He was experiencing the ultimate torture, spiritual dehydration, eternal thirst. Mm -hmm. And what's paradoxically and astonishing here is that it's because Jesus experienced this cosmic thirst, if you will, on the cross that we can have our spiritual thirst satisfied. Now, with Nicodemus, because he died, we can be born again. Mm -hmm. And that's the gospel. Yep. And it's the same for skeptics, for believers, for the moral, for the immoral, for the religious, and for the non-religious, and for everybody in between. Come on. And that's what Jesus is telling us in these yes. two stories. Yes. They've both got the same problem. They're both separated from God. They're cut off from the eternal flow of God. And it's so cool how Jesus at the very end, he brings it all together by saying, I thirst. He explains this deep inner thirst that he'd never experienced before. He knew it. He knew it by, by the people that were separated from him. But he had never experienced it until that moment. He knows what that thirst is. And, of course, he knew by foreknowledge when he dealt with this woman. And he understood that this man, this Pharisee, was suffering from the same dehydration, the same torture as this woman was. Their means of trying to satisfy it was just different. But the separation was just as real. And remember that when you deal with people whether they claim to be believers and they're just religious people without any real relationship with God or they're the rankest of sinners. How we often show respect to people because they go to church but don't really, aren't really born again. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying we're the judge of that. I'm just saying we know people that are religious people but they have no real compassion, no real love, no, no real expression of this river of life flowing through them from God. And then we look at the person who's on the street or who's mixed up in all the failed affairs and, and alcohol and whatever else they're situated, and we look at them as if this person over here is still a better person. No, they're not. To God, these both have the same value, so much value that he died for them. Come on. And when you look at Jesus, he's not critical or hateful to either one of them, but to the one he says, look, let's cut to the chase. You're religious. You need to be born again. He's not mean to the guy. He just says, look, you know enough about religion that I don't have to spend a whole lot of time here. Your problem is that you don't have a deep, fulfilling, satisfying relationship with Jesus, with God. That's what you need to do is be born again. Mm -hmm. To the woman, he's actually more gentle yeah. because he knows she's never experienced anything like this. She's been spending her whole life grubbing and clawing at anything that will fulfill her, that will give her some sense of purpose or, or, or value or peace or pleasure. Mm -hmm. And so he's gentle with her. He said, look, I know what you're looking for. It's not men. It's not another drug. It's not another alcohol. It's not another woman. It's not another dollar or ten dollars or a thousand dollars. It's Jesus. Lord. And to both of them, once you find him, then your religious situation will be satisfied. You can enjoy your religious experience Lord. because it's from the basis of this grace relationship from God. And for you who have known no religion, you can have the same experience. God wants to do the same thing for you. Amen. It's a respect for people. It's a respect for God's creation and his desire to see them saved and respected and valued by everybody. God so loved the world that he gave. And I promise you, I don't care how belligerent people are, 
They're hungry and they're thirsty. They just don't know what it is they're hungry and thirsty for. Whether they're millionaires or they're poverty stricken, the same hunger is in every one of us. It was created by God when we were created in his image. That desire to be completed in him. So don't let people put you off. Don't let them, don't let them offend you. Just recognize that's how they are today. But look at their lives. You can see it, whether they're, whether they're successful, quote, unquote, or failures. They have the same drive. Because all you got to do is pick up a magazine or turn on the news and watch TV. Hollywood, people be stru struggling to be the most beautiful, you know, the most uh, loved and, and uh, the wealthiest and the most successful. And they're out shooting themselves in the head and driving off of cliffs and one relationship after another and, and just drugs and alcohol and the whole thing. Why? Because all of this that they thought was a drive for success, when they get the success, the success doesn't satisfy. And the same way with the guy on the street. I mean, if I could just get this woman, and she kicks him off. And, or if I could just, just, just get high today, just get through this day. Huh? Or just another drink, just, you know, just a few more bucks and it'll be all right. Just everybody is looking for a way to tilt the odds in their favor. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? whether it's drugs or alcohol or relationships or money, whatever it is, everybody's trying to get the edge, to find the, something that will make it all make sense, make it all worthwhile. It's just not there. Mm -hmm. It's only in Christ. It's only in God that we're ever going to be satisfied. Mm -hmm. that, that deep, longing, aching thirst can be satisfied. It's true of every living being. Because if those two have something in common, everybody's got something in common. Mm -hmm. And that commonality is this thirsting for God. Mm -hmm. This spiritual awakening and reality. The, 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 the water that wells up in us, a well, that not only gives us a moment of satisfaction, but continuous satisfaction so that circumstances, the world, success, failure doesn't change. Doesn't change who we are, doesn't change what we are. Again, nothing wrong with being driven for success or having dreams, hopes and expectations. As long as they're in the context and you recognize them for what they are. Because they in and of themselves are never going to be the answer. It's only through Christ that we're fulfilled and satisfied. Because believe me, the older you get, the more you realize this is such a brief period in eternity. And we make such a big deal out of it. I heard somebody talking about just the other day. If we really believed the way Paul believed, the way the New Testament believed, relative of, of uh, Sheila's. I'm not saying we shouldn't pray because we're here. God has given us healing and deliverance and so forth. But we ought to be as excited when the doctor says, sorry, it's terminal, as when he says, can't find any cancer. If we really believe heaven is what heaven is mm -hmm. and Jesus is who Jesus is, mm -hmm. it shouldn't matter. Right. Paul said, I'm in a strait between two places. One, I'd like to go on and be with Jesus. I know that's the best. But then I feel obligated to stay and try to help you people out too. I've got to admit, when you think of dying, generally all we think about is what we're leaving behind. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're hoping for this, <laughs> this thing to come. But the truth is, most of the time, we're thinking more about what's, what's going to be here after we're gone than we are about what we're gaining when we leave. There should be no fear in a Christian when it comes to dying. There right. should be no anxiety, no stress, no anything. It ought to be just, man, 
I cannot imagine how good this is going to be, how great it's going to be. No more tears, no more sadness, no more sorrow, no more failure, no more success. Everybody's a winner. Amen. It's all good forever. Hallelujah. Greater than we can ever imagine. Amen. That's what we need. That's what the church needs. Amen. That's what the world needs. Amen. This isn't all. This is just a little bit. Very little. Can you say praise the, Lord? praise the Lord? Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed in the name of the Lord. Say, I'm just as good as you are. <laughs>